change the proportionality to a constant of integration or constant of proportionality which is now f is g m m by r squared. This is the famous Newtonian law of gravity. Now between the two particles, one thing you please note here, this is irrespective of where the particles are, the moment you have two particles with masses m and m, there is a force acting between the two given by this formula. Now, this derived by Newton using simple concepts of calculus and geometry. Now, these laws of motion and the law of gravitation actually formed the basis for development of physics, particularly the description of the macroscopic world. Next important mathematical tool on which the study of physics depends is the vector analysis that includes both vector algebra and vector calculus. Apart from gravity, the most important macroscopic interaction of nature is electromagnetism, which is also a long range force and follows gravity in the sense that it also is governed by the inverse square law. The basic equation of electrostatics is the Coulomb's law that exists between two charges as given by F equal to E1, E2, R by E, R cube, which essentially says that this is proportional to 1 by R squared. In fact, as perhaps most of you know, this law was obtained by Coulomb through experiment, the famous torsion balance experiment. He actually measured with two charged spheres the torque produced and then he concluded that the force must be given by this expression. Now similarly between two magnetic poles there exists a force which is given by P1, P2 or by mu or Q. This epsilon and mu are what are called constants of this is the permeability constant mu and it is the dielectric constant epsilon and these two constants depend upon the medium in which the charges or the magnetic poles are located. Now the intensity of the electric or magnetic field is measured in terms of the number of lines of force passing through a unit area at right angles to the direction of lines which indeed is a constant for a given charge or magnetic poles. Now using Coulomb's law, one can then get the intensity E for a charge E to be equal to E upon 4 pi epsilon r squared. Now as the lines of force emanate radially in all directions now around the charge, the number of ch lines leaving one charge is E is E upon epsilon, epsilon being the dielectric constant. Now if there are more than one charge, then the number could simply be added. Now as the field intensity is given by E, this number should be equal to E dot dA, dA being an element of the area covering the charges under consideration. Thus one has the equation Ne is integral of A over A E dot dA which can be expressed as, as we know that the integral also can be expressed as summation 1 upon epsilon because as we said if there are more charges simply add them i equal to 1 to n ei which is 1 upon epsilon integral rho dv and here rho gives the charge density in the volume V surrounded by the area A. Having gotten this now by simple Gauss's theorem of vector calculus one has for any e, any vector we know that this is integral over v of the divergence of the vector is equal to integral over the area of the, the vector times the area, the dot product of here. Now using this you simply get the relation divergence of e equal to 4 pi rho upon epsilon, the famous 
Gauss's law of electrostatics. Let us now consider magnetostatics. Now, for a volume V having magnetic poles, the number of magnetic lines of force would be again given by N m just similar to the other one integral over A of B dot d A. Now, B being the magnetic field intensity, but most important thing that comes here is Unlike in the case of electrical charge, as there are no magnetic monopoles, magnetic poles occur in pairs, always such that it is a plus and a minus or north and south. And therefore, the lines of force which all start at the north pole go to south pole and they are all closed. Therefore, in the given volume, all the lines of force are closed and so there is nothing going out of the volume out the surface and therefore it shows that the number of lines coming out would be zero which means that this number which is here is zero or equivalently when the integral over the volume of this is zero the integrand itself is zero therefore we get the second law divergence of b equal to zero which is again a most fundamental law of nature the existence of monopoles have not been seen so far. Ampere, a celebrated French scientist, had discovered in 1820 that two voltaic currents exert forces on each other just as magnetic poles or electric charges and thus concluded that small closed currents behaved exactly like elementary magnets. In essence, Ampere had discovered that whereas a static collection of charges just produce an electric field, a flowing current of charges produces a magnetic field, a very important law. This was discovered by Ampere. Now, the relation between the current J and the magnetic intensity H is expressed by the well known Bio Savart law as given by h is equal to j into l by c r square. l is the length of the loop. As one needs to generalize this to a form, to include lines of force, one can define a current density j, which is j upon pi r square, this is the area, or being the radius of the circle over which the current is distributed. Now, one can then write the equation ch by pi l equal to j which holds for every cross section and thus in terms of lines of force. Now, as the direction of magnetic field should be at right angles everywhere to each length of the wire and the radius r, it becomes clear that the lines of force must lie along the tangents to the circumference of circles around the current carrying wires. Now, if one considers the integral of h along a closed path around the wire, one gets integral b dot dl or l is mu by c integral a over a j dot dA with b equal to mu times h. A is the area enclosed by the chosen path and mu is the magnetic permeability. Now, using the well known Stokes theorem of vector calculus, which uses the fundamental theorem of integral calculus also, one finds integral over L b dot dl is integral over a curl b dot dA, which in turn leads to the Ampere's law curl b is equal to mu j upon c. On the other hand, Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction tells that a moving magnet induces an electric current in a conducting loop of wire which may be described mathematically as follows. Before this I would like to just uh, recall a very interesting anecdote in this context. As we all know Faraday should be given the full credit for making our lives easy here today because without the electrical electricity generated from 
using the magnetic field we would not be having the modern world going when faraday discovered this he wanted to show it to the public and apparently he made all the arrangements and including the mayor of the town was inv invited to view the experiment so faraday had a coil of wire and then he had a magnet which he started introducing in and out of the coil continuously and the coil was connected to a galvanometer and it showed reflection deflections indicating that the current was flowing in the current also a bulb which was attached glowed apparently all the people clapped except the good old mayor he was very skeptical he said oh what use is this faraday it seems simply smiled and said sir shortly you will be taxing this and we know today how without that electricity nothing can really work now let's come back to the mathematics of this one so faraday's law of electromagnetic induction tells that a moving magnet induces an electric current in a conducting loop of wire which may be described mathematically as follows if n denotes the magnetic flux the number of lines of force passing through the area surrounded by the conducting loop its rate of change produces an electromotive force as given by e is equal to minus d nm by dt with nm is integral b dot da according to the definition of the electric field e the induced emf e corresponds to the integral of e around the circuit integral over l e dot dl which in turn by stokes theorem is equal to integral over a curl e dot da hence the faraday's law of electromagnetic induction is represented by the equation curl e is equal to minus 1 upon c delta b by delta t so in the mid 19th century we had four sets of equations representing for us the electric and magnetic fields and they were all different in the sense that the british physicist j c maxwell he noticed that he wrote down all of them together that is the first thing he did the divergence of e is 4 pi rho upon epsilon curl of p is mu j upon c divergence of b is 0 and curl of e is minus 1 upon c delta b by delta t what the young maxwell was wondering about was if as we understand electricity can produce magnetism and magnetism can produce electricity why in their mathematical descriptions there is no symmetry he asked himself the question that's the power of mathematics the moment you represent in terms of mathematical symbols and equations you can see a different beauty in it and also a different set of information can come and new ideas can occur therefore he felt that there must be something else because these equations did not become is was found satisfactory by him now as he argued the same as i just now said the moving electric field produces magnetic effects and vice versa why then there was no matching in the equations of ampere and faraday he concluded that as there was an explicit term indicating the time variation of the magnetic field in the source term for induced current there should be a similar term indicating the time variation of electric field in the source term for the induced magnetic field suggesting that the ampere's law needed modification which he achieved in 1864 and it can be expressed in a simple form as follows if one considers an imaginary closed surface a around an electric circuit and try to find out the net current flowing through the surface it is simply integral j dot da which will be positive if there is a net outflow of current 
indicating an accompanying reduction of charge density within the volume covered by A. Now, if rho is the charge density, then the rate of loss will be given by time derivative of integral rho dB. This leads to the equation integral over A, J dot dA is given by minus of del del T integral over V rho dB. Now, using Gauss's theorem 2.7, you know, this can be written as integral over V div J dV is minus of del del T integral over V rho dV. So, this clearly shows that div J should be equal to delta rho by delta T with a minus sign. This is just the equation of continuity. Now, going back to Ampere's law and taking the divergence of this, one gets divergence of j equal to 0 as on the left hand side we have the divergence of the curl of a vector which is identically 0. Thus, in term implies delta rho by delta t equal to 0 which can be true only for steady currents whose rate of flow is constant. Thus, Maxwell found the necessity to change Ampere's law by adding a new term which he called the displacement current and wrote the equation to be curl of B should be mu upon C j plus j naught which is true only if divergence of j naught is minus divergence of j because left side divergence of this should be, should, be, should be 0. Therefore, as div j is minus of delta rho by delta t and the first equation of electrostatics or the Gauss's law divergence of E is 4 pi rho by epsilon, it is easy to show that J naught upon epsilon is delta E by delta T. Thus, one gets the modified Ampere's law. Curl of B is mu by C J 